Welcome to BIPAC News on the Jewish TV channel. I'm Andrew Pesson, your campus correspondent and also campus bureau editor of the Algeminer, a leading news source on all issues of concern to Jews and about Israel. Please do sign up for the daily newsletter at algeminer.com to stay abreast of all the relevant news, as well as following us here at BIPAC. I also moderate a Facebook group called Anti-Zionism on Campus, so come join us there if you're on Facebook, and do follow me on Twitter slash X for all of your campus news. For more about me and my work, please visit my website, um, andrewpesson.com. As for the campus scene for Jews in Israel, it's hard not to think that we are entering dark times, eerily reminiscent of earlier very dark times. In 2018, I published a book called Anti-Zionism on Campus, documenting not merely the hostility, but really the hatred of Jews in Israel that's appearing on many campuses, which had already begun transforming from expressing opinions to discriminatory and harassing actions. It's only gotten worse since then, as Jews, in particular Zionist Jews, but in fact, all Jews are genuinely under assault, verbal and sometimes physical on many campuses. But it's not just on university campuses anymore, as the assault on Jews and Israel has in recent years begun moving into the kindergarten through 12th grade realm as well. And perhaps no state has taken a darker turn in that regard than California. A movement there has taken hold to mandate teaching a high school curriculum that demonizes Israel and the Jews to inculcate that hate at the earliest possible ages. Perhaps no one has done more to call attention to this movement and to fight back against it than today's guest, Tammy Rossman Benjamin. Formerly a professor for many years at UC Santa Cruz, now a co-founder and director of the wonderful organization Amcha Initiative, which deserves your support. Tammy is with us today to catch us up on what the heck is going on in California and what we all can do about it. Tammy, thank you for joining us on the program. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here and with you for discussing this topic. It, it's a real pleasure to have you, you know, in getting ready for this uh, conversation, I dug up um, all of your articles on the topic in question, and I have in my hand a very thick stack of some <laughs> a lot articles of homework. <laughs> going back three and a half years, early 2020. So you've been calling attention to this, battling this. You're like the, I don't know if the canary in the coal mine is the right metaphor, but you saw it early. You've been calling attention to it. Sometimes I think a lone voice in the wind, but um, thank you for the work that you've done on this. It's it's essential, and as uh, I imagine we'll see, it's essential to get the word out about this movement because it's not just California, right? It's not just crazy California that this is happening. This is It's already spreading other places. California is up in the front line of these things. So first and foremost, thank you and kudos to you for the, the work, the Thanks. many hours of work and attention that you have put to this. So thank you. Um, I, if we could start, maybe you could just tell us a tiny little bit about yourself and your background, how you found your way into the world of, you know, Jewish and Israel advocacy. And please do tell us a little bit about Amcha Initiative and the, the wonderful work. Sure. That you sure. Well, as you pointed out, I was a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz. I like to think of it as the belly of the beast when it comes to the kinds of issues that we're dealing with. And that's actually what inspired me to, to act. Um, I was teaching for 20 years. I taught Hebrew and Jewish studies. So I really was very connected with the students that were most impacted by what was unfolding, mostly, at least from my perspective, from, from a, a faculty place, right? My, our initial, my initial efforts were, were really directed at what I saw as, as these egregious abuses of university faculty to impose their primarily anti-Zionist um, uh, sentiments in their classroom on their students with, with grave effects for the campus climate for Jewish students at my university. So that's essentially how I got involved. Students would come to my office and cry about what was happening. And a lot of it, as I said, was coming from faculty and the students just didn't have the wherewithal or the desire um, to stand up to uh, their faculty. And so I decided, what the heck? <laughs> I, I, I felt very um, uh, close to my students. And I felt like it was sort of my responsibility you, you, to step you up. That to person. And so people that was... should recognize as we send our you know, Jewish students to these campuses, 
they a people should be alert and aware to what they're going to confront there. And for a, a Jewish student on a campus, especially you're away from home for the first time for many of them, um, it's scary and isolating. And so thank goodness there's the occasional faculty mem member like yourself to be a person there. But of course, um, right. students need, I think, some outside support from the community as well. Right. And so I, I joined together with uh, another faculty member from UCLA, Dr. Leela Beckwith, to actually actually fight this from the inside, in a, in a sense, with a, a knowledge of how universities work, a knowledge of how, let's say, faculty senates work, a knowledge of how administrations work, the uh, shared governance. I mean, the 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 story on campuses is very complicated. It's very complicated to get at what the problem is and actually to affect a solution. And we felt we had a way to do that. So we founded an organization to do that, not just at UC Santa Cruz or UC, but nationally. And that's what we've been doing. We, we uh, I guess, about 10 years now, a little yes. bit more, we started an organization that documents. We have a big database, online database, publicly accessible that I urge your listeners to go to, to look up any campus, any issue. Um, we okay. keep track. We have 6,000 incidents in our database on over 400 campuses. Even, we invest even just for that alone, that's such an essential piece it of is. what you're it doing. Is. And I know my oldest son is looking at colleges now, and as he sort of finalizes his list of places to apply to, one of the things we do is we go into the AMCA database. We want to get a sense of, right. you know, what is that campus like for a Jewish student, right. for a Zionist student, et cetera. So your, your database is invaluable for that. It's also important to us because we actually use it to do research. And right. we've published uh, a few dozen reports, uh, uh, two or three annually, about what's happening, looking at it from various perspectives over, over more than 100 campuses. Um, over years looking at trends to actually understand what the problem is, to be data-driven, because we're academics after all. We want right. to understand the problem, not just in a knee-jerk way, but actually to really see what's going on and to be able to document it and prove it, give evidence to university administrators to actually address the problem. So that's what we do. We also work in specific areas to actually combat anti-Semitism. And one of the new areas to sort of segue into this topic of du jour is, is ethnic studies. Now, it's true that this issue that we're looking at right now is about high schools and K through 12, I guess, more broadly, and that's a little bit out of our wheelhouse, except for the fact that about 10 years ago, I don't know if you actually looked at the essay that I published in 2013 in a book um, uh, on global anti-Semitism, which actually looked at the birth of ethnic studies at San Francisco State, one of the 23 Cal State campuses. But ethnic studies was actually born, the discipline of ethnic studies, as we know it, the discipline of ethnic studies was birthed at San Francisco State, as I like to say it, at the point of a gun. It was birthed with the longest and most violent strike in the history of higher education, six month strike, five month strike. Who that was striking? Was it? Was it the students. Uh, it was. It was. It was a strike that was organized by the Black Student Union and the um, uh, the Third World Liberation Front, that were both uh, tied to um, uh, paramilitary paramilitary groups. So this was really the, the the either violence or the threat of violence hung over this, and it was actually in, it really forced this new discipline, which was not really a discipline. It was just really a a, a sort of a political movement that was forced into the form of a discipline, right? Which which has enormous effects moving forward. But this 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 so-called discipline of ethnic studies was was basically at the point of a gun. The president at the time, the third one in a series of, of presidents who kept resigning over this strike, um, uh, really admitted to the uh, establishment of the College of Ethnic Studies. So, and, so just to jump in for a second. So this was at the was at the State University of San Francisco? 
This was at San Francisco State University, University, right? Um, in in 1969, 1969. This is the, lo- was, the long genesis of the issue. It goes exactly, back exactly, exactly. Yeah. But that was what I looked at because in nine in in the 2000s, from 2000 uh, even till today, there it, it, it San Francisco State has also been one of the the the, the key campuses for campus anti-Semitism. Right. There has been, it's been dubbed like decades in a row, the most anti-Semitic campus. Right. And I look and I try to understand that and ask the question, is there a relationship between the birth and evolution of ethnic studies at San Francisco State and the, uh, the uh, increase in uh, of anti-Semitism on campus. And lo and behold, there was a very significant um, uh, relationship, which when this ethnic studies issue came up at the high school level, I smelled I smelled a rat. I said- oh, Let me is- let me pause there. And I apologize for jumping in. Sure, no, um, so, you know, just to, to make clear that when I mentioned in my introductory remarks that uh, there's an effort, a movement underway to mandate uh, basically an anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, curriculum into high school, uh, it is this, um, the mandate is specifically that high school students should take, are required to take a course in ethnic studies. Uh, and that's why we're talking about ethnic studies. In ethnic studies, um, which, and here's maybe the tragic irony of all this, I'm sure many of us could agree the idea of ethnic studies is a wonderful idea. Uh, I, I read somewhere in one of your articles that California, there's something like 92 different languages spoken in California because it's a very heterogeneous place with lots of different communities. And there's lots of wonderful things to celebrate about the diversity and that we should learn about other cultures and our neighbors in so doing is just nothing but wonderful about that you would hope or think. But of course, the issue comes down to the exact content of the ethnic studies. And as it turns out, as you're you're pointing out now, ethnic studies from its beginning has built into it some mechanisms that seem rather uh, unfavorable to the Jews and, and to Israel. And so this otherwise maybe wonderful movement, maybe you'll disagree with me, but I, under, otherwise wonderful movement of teaching ethnic studies has been corrupted by this, um, we'll call it anti-Semitic mechanisms built in. Is that is that a fair summary? Sort of, almost. Okay. okay. Almost. All right. I would, argue, I would argue that, as I said, the, the, the strike at San Francisco State actually gave birth to a discipline that was dubbed ethnic studies. Now, we can we can argue over like just like I mean, if you think take an example that has nothing to do with ethnic studies, sort of, which is the definition of anti-Semitism. Right. Who gets to define what anti-Semitism is? And we feel very this is a personal issue. Of course, Jews get to define it. Of course, Jews, you know, who work in this area. Get, but it's become a very fraught issue. And then the, and, and it would, which gets a lot of people very confused because there are lots of definitions now swirling around with lots of you know, people who have lots of different motivations for promoting their definition. So the same thing is true with ethnic studies. The reason that we're even talking about ethnic studies, the reason that we're even talking about a curriculum, a requirement in California, a piece of legislation, right, is because of the strike at San Francisco State, I would argue. Mm -hmm. And therefore, ultimately, it's their definition of ethnic studies because this whole plan that we see that has been set in motion actually came from the people who are trying to promote their discipline of ethnic studies, which they have now established on almost every uh, California campus at the okay. higher education level. Oh, so, okay. so and, and you could, we can say, I mean, we can say, look, the words ethnic studies uh, of course, and this is how it was pitched, right? It's also there's a difference between what it is and how it's pitched, for instance, in order to pass a piece of legislation or in order to get what you want, you pitch it in the most um, uh, appealing way. You pitch as, it as I was just doing, right? That's exactly. what I was trying to it's do, right? Conflict. Wonderful. So it's beautiful. At, if you look at, for instance, the legislation that established both the 
um, the model curriculum, the state mandated model curriculum, which we'll talk about, as well as the requirement to teach ethnic studies with the re recommended use of that model curriculum, both pieces of legislation are presented in very benign ways, saying, look, California had their 92 languages spoken in California. It's one of the most ethnically diverse states in the union, right? How can we not have a, a, a discipline which actually, or a course which actually looks at the wonderful diversity of ethnic studies? But that's not at all what the people who pushed that and wrote that legislation actually had in mind. They didn't want to look at all of the uh, ethnic groups. They only wanted to look at four different groups of uh, uh, people of color, right? Groups of color. And they wanted to look at, at look at it through a particular politically motivated lens. Let, that, me, let me pause for one second there. So just maybe you can take us through the, at least the recent chronology of this. So we we see the origin of this discipline back in 1969 and the early 70s, the, the birth of the ethnic studies movement. But as, if we zip ahead to, I don't know, the 2010s or something like that, how did this movement take shape what are the, at least some of the right. highlights, the key steps in the chronology? And also just to clarify, um, we want to distinguish between the legislation mandating that every high school student take an ethnic studies course for graduation and then um, the development of a curriculum that could then fulfill that requirement and then the details of what's actually between the pages of that curriculum. And I know we owe it to you, our thanks that most people would read the description and say, of course, ethnic studies, wonderful, diverse, let's celebrate diversity. Right. But somebody has to actually open and look at the specific things they wanted to teach in that curriculum. And that's, of course, when the horror begins, when you look at the actual proposed curriculum. So if you could just take us through what are the highlights of the chronology over the last several years? Well, but if, if 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 you don't mind, um, with your permission, I just want to I just want to say one thing about, sure. or a couple of things about the nature of the ethnic studies that was birthed at San Francisco State, and as it's taught at both California State Universities and um, campuses, as well as University of California. So the discipline of ethnic studies, as it is taught. In university camp on universities uh, today, um, certainly in California, and I would argue across the country, in, at the level of of universities, colleges, and universities, is has at its core uh, principles that portray Jews and the Jewish state in anti-Semitic ways. So that's a, that's that's ultimately what Jews have to be, why Jews have to be concerned about ethnic studies. It's not because it focuses on certain ethnic groups and not others. It's not even because it may or may not include Jews. And I, from my perspective, because of what it is, we actually don't want it to include Jews because if it does, it's actually going to be taught in Thank ways you. that we will not like. But ultimately, we have to understand what it is why that we should be even concerned about this as Jews. And I can talk more about that, but I just wanted to get that out there. And I can actually document that later be before, but I just wanted to get out there before I go on with the chronology, because people might say, well, what's the big deal? Why are you going right. into this whole history? You've documented it well in the many articles that, uh, you know, that you've written over the last right. several years, like uh, the I, 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 as I a discipline, so. as a problem, as an academic discipline. It really is a problem, and it is uh, the, the single most and for certainly the single most anti-Zionist discipline in the academy uh, by all, so many measures. But again, I can document that later. Chronology. After the birth of the strike, I mean, after the strike, the decade after the strike, there was an enormous increase in ethnic studies programs on all California campuses and in campuses across the country. Dozens of programs, hundreds of programs, most universities, the majority of universities offered some kind of ethnic studies, black studies programming that wasn't true before what happened, the revolution at San Francisco State. What happened in the succeeding decades, like the 80s and the 90s, was either a stagnation 
or uh, a, a diminution of, of funding and enrollment in those programs. I think it kind of got old and students realized that there was little that they could do with an ethnic studies degree. And, and so by the early 2000s, I, I guess it wasn't about 2007, at Cal State especially, they, they, ethnic studies was being considered for the chopping block. Ultimately, I mean, this whole big, you know, sort of movement that started had started in the late '60s was now sort of petering out um, because of lack of interest. Ultimately, but what happened at California State University in 2013? It was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for these old. And so at least one of them was sort of an aging activist who was originally involved with one of the, the, the black movements that was actually a, a rival to the Black Panthers called Us that was founded by the um, a fellow named Milana Karenga, which was also a, at the time a kind of a paramilitary group that engaged in violent shootouts, killing Black Panthers, in fact, in, in, the, in the early 70s. But this fellow now is, a, he actually is a well-known uh, Black scholar. Uh, he uh, created uh, Kwanzaa, and he is a professor of Pan-African Studies still, at, at uh, Cal State Long Beach. And his program was going to be ready to be, it was called, I um, uh, forget what the word, but it was going to be uh, demoted from right. a department to a program. Right. And that got him so upset and, and sort of put him and other activist faculty, including his colleague, Melina Abdullah, who also taught Pan-African studies and still teaches at Cal State LA, who is also one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter. She founded the Black Lives Matter LA movement um, and, and very connected to state legislators and another uh, Cal State faculty member named Teresa Montano, who was very involved in the K through 12 uh, education, teacher training and education. Uh, she was a Cal State Northridge and still is. And, and together, I think, or at least uh, in some combination, they came up with the plan um, to actually save ethnic studies at Cal State. And what did that plan involve? It, it, it had a few different prongs. The first prong was to get, ultimately it was to get ethnic studies to be such a strong and robust program that it could not be cut from the university. Right. And, and the first part of that was to get it to be a requirement at Cal State. Um, a which requirement for admission to the California State Universities. No, re oh, a requirement no. of Cal State students that once they got to Cal oh, State, they had to take a semester of ethnic studies, which would actually populate ethnic studies classes. Right, so put seats in put the classroom seats. and therefore require hiring more professors, et cetera, right? Exactly, it would call filled seats in ethnic studies classrooms, which was the problem about why it was being cut. That was the first pro That was the first effort. The second effort, the second prong of that effort, right, because you don't just want uh, one, you know, uh, students who take the, the court, their required course, you want, you want, you want programs, that have right? Yeah, right? And what do you need for that? You need something to entice them. What, what, what could entice them more than the possibility of getting a job after they graduate? And what could do that? was if you required ethnic studies in every high school in the state, you would need ethnic studies teachers to teach those courses. And that is- So are you seriously, so in terms of getting a job in, you know, a job in ethnic studies, there aren't, as you said at the beginning, it's not, you know, how many jobs can you get with a degree in ethnic studies? Well, you could get a job teaching ethnic studies. That's so. Right. So th this idea of mandating ethnic studies in high school was partly motivated by finding employment for people who have ethnic studies degrees, which I is partly motivated argue, by keeping the program alive in their in their college. I would I would argue that that it was primarily that was the like mostly ninety percent ninety five percent motivated by that. 
right? Oh. And this is, this is, you know, and, and what, and, and it makes sense. So it's not, it, you know, we talk about a curriculum, we talk about a requirement, but it's really an industry. It's really a racket in a sense right. for these people to be able to keep their jobs and to be able to actually not just keep their jobs, but to right. have power in the institutions where they were previously fairly powerless. Now, I suppose just to take slightly devil's advocate ever so slightly in this particular issue, if you could make the case that the ethnic studies curricula that they are developing were really truly valuable and important, etc., this would not be such a horrible problem because, it, you know, in the same way, everyone should be studying mathematics to be a basic sort of numerically literate person for their future welfare, etc. You could make the case that studying ethnic studies really brought that kind of value, then maybe it doesn't look so dark and foreboding that they are working to spread, you know, find employment for ethnic studies graduates to keep their own jobs and create the teaching. But of course, the problem is, again, as we come back to this, the, the content of the ethnic studies that they're teaching is not so wonderful. It's got this. And it, and it, not, and it, that, it, it actually, I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to the birth, but it really is about the birth. It really is from the original sin of ethnic studies is that, is that it wasn't birth like any other discipline in the academy. It was, it was, which, which, which is, which actually makes a case. Every, every discipline that we know up until that point, was birthed because there was a, a, an academic and intellectual reason for, for, for the study of a particular field. That wasn't the case with, with ethnic studies. There was no good academic reason to, you know, to unlike any other, like mathematics, science, history, English, whatever. It wasn't, because it wasn't about a body of knowledge. It was a political movement. It was, it was to use the academy as a, as a means of advancing a political goal, which was the re, which was revolution, right? right. Which, which was ultimately a, a, a neo-Marxist revolution to transform society to you know a, a particular goal. Now, you could say so. What happens in 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 such a so-called discipline that's not a discipline is that you are you are coercing people to believe. First of all, it's not academic. It's not scholarly. There are no scholarly standards that it stands up to because it's not you know it's not trying to come to it's not you know trying to analyze the facts and giving you the tools to do that to come up with your own conclusions etc it's actually starting with a set of foregone conclusions and forcing everybody to accept that because those are the basis for the political activism that you're for, right. again forcing on students right. so the whole thing is a coercive exercise and anybody who doesn't accept it any other discipline you can question challenge that's the whole nature of the discipline so you have a theory you discard the theory but with ethnic studies if you challenge the theory if you challenge the assumptions you are branded using the terminology of that ethnic studies as the weapon against its it's it's you know those who challenge it you are branded a racist a white supremacist an imperialist all of those terms that are that are taught as the basic tools of ethnic studies. Right. So this is this is the problem. It's it's a coercive discipline being not just and it's not just people who have you know a particular uh, a particular sorry about this. It's not just people who have um, a particular um, uh, uh, you know, a, a choice about whether they want to take such a thing or not. It's saying that every student has Standing to take a, 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 a discipline which is not a discipline, which is coercive and ultimately, as I said, right. as I said, anti anti Semitic. And so, as you, you know, as you've laid it out, it's sort of a brilliant tactical strategy. You're in the process of making a very powerful case that Jews really need to resist this. It's not it's not in the best interest of Jews. It violates academic norms in general. There's a lot of problems with it. Right. But just in terms of our own advocacy, Jews need to resist this. But resisting it will immediately get you labeled as a racist. Resisting okay. ethnic studies gets you labeled as a racist or a white supremacist. So it just it's it's gaslighting to the maximum degree. It's very 
devastating. Well, it's, it's, another layer, it's another layer of anti-Semitism. So there's the anti-Semitism that sort of exists that's part and parcel of the discipline. And then there's what I call backlash anti-Semitism, which is that if you speak because of its coercive politicized nature, anybody who opposes it is a political opponent that right. gets bashed with using anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish power, Jewish, Jewish power, malevolence. Right. Etc. And and so just to come back to the chronology now. So in 2013 or so, this is when the the modern this movement begins to mandate um, uh, high school taking high school students having um, ethnic studies course. Um, let's maybe zip ahead a little bit. I think that so eventually me, becomes a piece of legislation. And right. so let me talk about. So let me. So there was, as I said, there was there there were key people in the legislature that worked with these people. For instance, Malina, uh, Malina Abdullah, the, the head of Black Lives Matter, who is also the head of Pan-African Studies, was uh, very good friends with Shirley Weber, who had taught um, from the early 70s, had taught ethnic studies at San Diego State University, Pan-African Studies as well, who went on to be a state legislator and is now the Secretary of State for California, but when she was a state legislator, she was head of the Jewish caucus that pushed for the legislation to make ethnic, and she was the one behind the legislation to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement at, at Cal State. So, so it was a, a, first it was at Cal State, as I said, that was the first prong. The second prong was primarily with the um, uh, Latino caucus, and they worked with Teresa Montano, who was also the head or one of the heads of the teachers, the large, powerful teachers unions that supported these legislator, the, this legislation. And these le legislators actually gave generously to these legislators. And this uh, two uh, Latino um, uh, legislators, uh, uh, Luis Alejo first, and then Jose Medina, put forth working with with the uh, Latino faculty and, and an advocacy group called Ethnic Studies Now, um, actually created legislation that did two things. Because in order to have, so there are two prongs to this effort to get Ethnic Studies to be a requirement at in all high schools, for all high schools, public and charter high school students. The first, the, because it's not just enough to have a requirement, because what if they believe like you do, that ethnic studies should be sort of a wonderful, wonderful. Uh, study of, of multicultural diversity in California. That would not fit the bill. That right. would not require courses in critical liberated ethnic studies that we find on university campuses. So they let have me just, to... Let me just push back a little bit because I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time and I want to make sure certain sure. key things get dressed. So, so um, legislation is ultimately passed um, what year was that when the, mandating that high as a high school graduation requirement, a course in ethnic studies? That was mandated in 2021. 2021. But in, 20, but in 2016, but, you have to understand this. In 2016, in order to fit, this was the first step was actually to create a state ethnic studies model curriculum that could be used in the requirement the high schools to fulfill the requirement exactly and this so that, initial model curriculum was of course viciously anti-semitic so maybe right. you can tell us a little bit just uh, some of the details about the first when it was called the model curriculum so the model right. ethnic studies so it, was introduced, so it was actually it was actually written by people who were actually part of this movement, that right. this whole movement that we're talking about. Right. These were not neutral people drafting a curriculum. These were people right. with their These political were agenda. Who were hand selected to be on the committee to write this curriculum with the goal in mind that it would serve as the curriculum for the requirement. So the right. first curriculum looked like an ethnic studies university curriculum that included the, the sort of anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish tropes of Jewish Jewish wealth, Jewish power, as well as anti-Zionism. It, it promoted BDS. It was it was it's a boycott, divestment, sanction movement against a global movement to isolate and boycott Israel. And, right. 
and it was roundly condemned by state legislators, the governor, the 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 public, and ultimately by the state department, the board of education, who. So um, moment, so yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but so so momentarily, there's a victory. So the. Um, this curriculum is presented. It's horribly anti-Semitic. Maybe we can summarize it as saying these are tropes that will be familiar, I'm guessing, to many viewers, that it's seeing Jews as basically white oppressors who are filled with privilege. And it's seeing Israel as a settler or colonial enterprise that um, has ethnically cleansed Palestine, all the yeah. absolute worst ways you can think of Jews and of Israel, and actively supporting this political movement, the boycott, I bet, the BDS movement. So this was what was proposed to be taught to every high school student in California, right? These these images of the Jews. But the minor victory was that there was a big, in fact, there was a big widespread backlash and uh, outrage against this curriculum, right? right. So it, it didn't get through on its first pass. However, oh, it's, not gone. It was, it's not gone. It's what, it was revised. Two things happened. It was revised. And in, and in 2021, it was state, a state approved revision, which effectively, from my perspective, just sort of white out, out white, you know, white outed the, those parts that were really egregious, right. but it kept the same structure, the same guidelines. It really is uh, underneath it all, uh, a, a critical, critical ethnic studies curriculum, but it's only recommended. And once the bill passed, the bill uh, in 2021, a previous version of that bill to require um, uh, ethnic studies was vetoed. But once guardrails were added that were supposed to sort of keep out the this first draft or the liberated, but what is now called the liberated curriculum because of a group of um, um, those first drafters that formed a consulting group called the Liberated Ethnic Studies Curriculum Consulting uh, Group. Um, they And that may try to now is pushing that first draft or a version of that first draft that they call a liberated curriculum into school districts through their consulting services. That, but ultimately, school districts, here's the, here's the rub, school districts that are um, uh, required to adopt uh, an ethnic studies curriculum for the requirement can actually choose which curriculum to use, which opens it up. Do you choose the state mandated curriculum, which is not great? Do you choose the liberated curriculum, which is much worse? Or do you go with something else? Right. That's, so that's pretty much where we are now, at least as we're talking about the general outline of what's happening. Okay, so to summarize then, uh, the law has been passed that uh, high school students require an ethnic studies course for graduation. The issue then is which ethnic studies curriculum will different school districts choose? The original model one was terribly anti-Semitic um, and got sent back to be revised. Um, and so the state is now offering the revised one, but school districts are not required to do that revised one. They're free to choose whatever ethnic studies curriculum they want. And the original drafters, the political agents, the anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist agents who drafted this whole thing have actually formed a for-profit company working as consultants who happen to have been hired by many, many school districts in the state of California, which is indicating that many school districts are going to go ahead and adopt that viciously anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist curriculum anyway. Is that what is yes. that? Yes. Right. And and I just want our viewers to understand how dreadful this is. I mean, imagine. That's, and that's just the beginning. Student... That's well, just that's... the be... I would say that's just the beginning of the ethnic studies nightmare, because that's not to consider the other factors that have that don't have to do with that, that actually have to do with back to the universities, back to my playground, which is right. the university and the teacher training and legislation of of uh, ethnic studies certification and an ethnic studies, you see ethnic studies admissions requirement proposal, excuse me. For one, yeah. And a UC ethnic studies requirement admissions proposal, which is, which, which if it is actually approved in the academic senate would require every student 
who uh, who wants to be UC eligible to have taken a critical ethnic studies course. Or critical, you mean the, the bad version, the the deeply anti-Semitic right. version. Right. So this is so this this issue, what I'm what I'm trying to say is, I mean, I, I know you didn't anticipate this when you asked me on, Andy, and I'm no, sorry. I came into this depressed and now I'm even more depressed. But, so. but this but the you you must understand that this is such that the that the that this the, the the context of this and the scope of this is so much broader than a piece of paper that we call a curriculum. Like right. so much of right. our efforts have been focused on a curriculum. That's not the issue. That's but, just but, not the but, issue. You no, know, even what you're calling just the beginning, or I don't know, the the front edge of the spear or whatever that's coming after us, is the idea that every California high school student will be required to and is likely to be exposed to a curriculum that they basically teaches them that Jews are white oppressors, that Jews have no place in Israel, that Israel is a settler colonial uh, enterprise committing ethnic uh, cleansing and genocide against the Palestinians, etc. Every student in high school. And even worse, you just threw this in and it, it may be time for another discussion, but you know, a, a, one of the other proposals these same folks are pushing in addition to getting this curriculum taught in the high schools is that um, entrance to the University of California university system will require specifically the the bad curriculum, the evil curriculum, the one that's exactly, really Exactly, exactly. And then right. if that happens, it's game over because um, there won't be anything to prevent that. You wrote in one of your articles at one point, um, if that passes, then any California student who wants to go into the UC system, including private schools, right? This All the rest of this has been about public schools. But now if you want to go to the UC system of this proposal passes, which is which is pending, being discussed, about to be discussed, um, even private schools, and that includes Jewish schools. So Jewish students are going to be, if they want to go to UC, will be mandated to undertake a curriculum where they're taught how evil they are, right? That's like the unbelievable misery of this package. And another thread, which again, was probably better for another conversation, but it's part of the same package as you're pointing out is um, these folks are training a lot of the teachers who teach in secondary schools. Is that right? Not, not yet. yes, exactly right. Plus, they're but they're pushing same same deal as what they did with the requirement and and the uh, the curriculum legislation is that they're they're actually co-writing pieces of the they have the liberated ethnic studies uh, curriculum group actually uh, co-authored you know ghost wrote a piece of legislation to make to require all high school ethnic studies teachers to have a certification in ethnic studies for which they would have had to have studied ethnic studies at the at the university level right. Right? so that's again I, I i bring you back to the original game plan right. started back in 2013 this is their game plan and they are almost and it, it is within reach especially if you consider in 2013 only one percent of the high schools in california Offered. That's just 10 years ago. Only 1% of the high schools in California even offered an ethnic studies elective course. In 20 by 2025, every high school in the state is going to be required to offer and its students required to take an ethnic studies course. If you think about what an enormous campaign, an enormously successful campaign that was, it's just unbelievable mind-boggling and it is very very concerning um so two more questions as we we come towards the end um one is it's not just in california i know one of your articles was about this movement is underway in massachusetts as well um are you aware first of all like what's its status in massachusetts right now if you happen to have any knowledge about that I, and I just don't. more generally is it is it already underway and active in other states i think that it is i do um, I think it's it's uh, yes, I think it's it's active in Washington, in Vermont. I also think in Massachusetts. Um, but we haven't tracked that as carefully as as we've been tracking ethnic studies in the Golden State because because we really believe that if if and we really have to do whatever it is that we can do to stop this runaway train. Right? right, because I think there's very little that we can do, but I think there is, there are things that we can do, but they are, are in, in my opinion, they're sort of, 
they have to shoot for the moon, right? They have to get at the big picture because ultimately, I believe this battle cannot be fought at individual local school districts like right. whack-a-mole. It just, we don't have the resources. We're, as I like to say, we're outmanned and outgunned. We yeah, cannot right. fight this because they're connected to the unions. They're connected to the higher education. And, and they're connected to a campaign which has been incredibly successful. We don't right. have the resources to fight that everywhere. It, it does seem to me, anyone watching this, whatever state you're in right now a lot rides on california if it can be stopped or at least mitigated or restrained in california that will be helpful if it just has full rain in california then it's coming to a state near you if it's not already there and so everyone should help out in california which leads to the next and final question so what what can people do to support to fight against this to support you and your work against this what can the average viewer do to get involved in this and join the battle what what brought us back to this ethnic studies issue after the after the passage in 2021 of this requirement? I thought, okay, it's game over. We'll go back to the universities and do our you know could focus refocus a little bit. Um, but then what what I realized is in carefully reading the bill that actually created the requirement, it was very clear that state legislators were very, very worried about what kind of ethnic studies would come, uh, would, would, would follow with the, with the establishment of this requirement, knowing about the trajectory of the liberated group and what was happening at the universities. The state legislators knew that, the governor knew that, which was why he had vetoed the previous bill, the previous version of this bill in 2020. In 2021, they put in a series of guardrails to try to stop bigoted curriculum or even versions of the first draft explicitly saying that legislation from coming from being adopted by school districts. But I think state legislators still knew that that wasn't enough. And so they put in a last minute a guardrail, if you will, or amendment three days before they actually voted on it, which said that this bill is inoperative until the legislature funds it. Right? It was a bill that it was an amendment that wasn't made a lot of noise about, but it's there. And ultimately, if you look at the history of the bill, it has not yet been funded. And so what we're trying to do is bring to the awareness of school districts and state legislators in the face of a $32 billion deficit in California, we cannot afford ethnic studies. Plus it's, I mean, there, then there, there are a whole host of reasons why this is just not either the right time or that any time, I don't, I don't believe any time is the right time, but, but certainly now is not the right time to actually, you know, push this into prime time. And so that's how can, the how can viewers help you in this effort to make people aware there's still a way of stop. Well, it's not fully stopping it because school districts can still choose to do that's right. studies. They but can but still ultimately, that's not the budget. issue because what the issue isn't whether or not they choose to, to do ethnic studies. The issue is, is this a state mandated requirement? Because that's what's fueling the industry. If schools can adopt this or not for an elective or a self imposed requirement, that doesn't bother me in a sense. Not but much we can do about not, that anyway. That's not what's fueling the whole industry that I think is coming from the university. So if we can stop the state mandated requirement, we can stop the industry. And I think that's what we have to bring to the attention of school districts, that 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 people who can go to school board meetings when they are considering uh, adopting ethnic studies or the requirement saying, look, you are not, we don't believe that this is a funded mandate. A ask the legislators, ask the, the, the uh, Department of Education. We do not believe, because why should we waste our local school districts funding on this when our students are struggling with all of the post-pandemic education losses. This is not what we want. It's too controversial, too expensive, too costly in so many ways. So how, 
brass tacks. How are you reaching school districts? Are you writing letters to people? Are you letters? To people? We've been writing letters. We've been writing uh, coalition letters, petitions to state legislators, particularly members of the Jewish caucus, who were effectively at the forefront of valuing this, right? At the, at the forefront of it, because they were the ones that essentially supported AB 101, that supported the bill, that gave us this requirement. So now we need to throw it back to them and say, you're the only ones who can help us with this. And if you can't help us with this, it really is game over. So viewers can help if they happen to know people in California in school districts, obviously reaching out, making them aware of this, supporting AMCA initiative and its efforts to do this canvassing, get this word out. Any other things that come to mind that folks can do? You know, if they want to write to the University of California, we just sent a hundred group letter um, to the California uh, UC Regents, University of California Regents, just to actually warn them about this ethnic studies admissions proposal that was making its way through, the, that is making its way through the academic senate and telling them, you've got to stop this, right? This is an outrageous proposal that's going to unleash anti-Semitism in our state. All right. Thank you, uh, Tammy. This was a very depressing conversation in many I'm respects. Sorry, there's no, you know, I, I'm a very depressing person. As soon as I talk about these issues, there, there's little glimmers of hope. You know, when you mentioned there's that that little clause, the bill has passed. It's, it is legislation, but that little clause that says until separate funding is legislated to support the bill, then it's not really fully completely passed right. or something like that. That's that one. That's that one little loophole that hopefully you know you're getting in through there and making the progress to stop this otherwise runaway train. So there's there's that reason for hope, and hopefully we can, as the word spreads, we can get more folks to participate in this campaign. Again, if we don't stop it in California, it's coming to a state near you. Absolutely. And before, before you know it, dozens of states will require their high school students to learn about how evil the Jews are in high school, um, and that's very very scary. So. Thank you so much for your time. Um, that's all for today. Remember, folks, do sign up for the Algaminer newsletter. Join my Facebook group. Follow me on Twitter and check back with BIPAC, where we'll be debuting a regular campus roundup feature very, very shortly. For the Jewish TV channel and BIPAC News, I'm Andrew Pesson. Hope to see you back here soon.